But let me just, uh, yeah, so this is Sarah. And Sarah does many things. She's starting with, she's at Duchess Outreach. Uh, she's one of the main people there. Um, she is a Poughkeepsie City Common Council member, an elected official. Uh, and then that means... Sit on the down low. <laughs> Um, she's an activist. Uh, she is on the Hudson Valley Industrial Development Association. Agency. Agency. Hey, I got that close. Yeah. I mean, she wears many hats here, um, and it's all part of you know the picture, the same picture for Sarah. But let's talk about Dutchess Outreach first. What is Duchess Outreach? Sure. So Duchess Outreach has existed in Duchess County for over 40 years. I think we're on like year 43 coming up in October. Um, and what we do is provide emergency relief and food access programming to all Duchess County residents. Uh, because we exist in the city of Poughkeepsie, most of whom we serve happen to also exist in the city. However, we do cover any Duchess County resident who needs our services. So. What does that look like? Through our emergency relief programming, we offer small one-time grants to prevent utility shutoff. So if you're facing a termination uh, from your utility company, we'll try and give you a grant so that you won't have your electricity shut off. Or if we can't issue you a grant, we'll try to advocate on your behalf with Central Hudson or whoever it happens to be. Um, we also issue small grants to provide prescriptions. So if you go to the doctor and you're, you know, you're diagnosed as diabetic or whatever it is, and then given a prescription and you can't afford the prescription, what good does that do you? So, so we can ensure that you're getting the health care that you need. We'll issue you a grant um, to do that. We used to provide grants to prevent eviction. However, there are other organizations in the community that are doing that, and there's only a small fund of money issue to provide those services, so we didn't want to take away from those other organizations and replicate any services. Our food access programming looks like a food pantry that administers up to a three-day supply of emergency food every 30 days for all Dutchess County residents. Um, we try to pack the bags as nutritionally as possible, but we are limited based on the donations of food we receive and the food that we purchase from the regional food bank. Um, our other program, one of the longest runnings, is called the Lunchbox, and that serves hot meals for lunch, for after school, and for dinner. On average, we're serving around 500 meals daily. Last year, out of that program, we served around 95,000 meals to uh, members of the community. That program, you can come as often or as little as you like. We're trying to create a consistent space for people to come and relax and build a sense of community. So. That being said, typically you'll hear these kinds of programs referred to as soup kitchens. We're trying not to use that term. We rarely serve soup. To me, it has a negative connotation, so we're calling it a community meal program instead. And we're trying to usher along that change with other organizations that do the same thing in the community. So, you know, people will be more likely to go in and not kind of like question whether or not they should be using a soup kitchen. Um, we have a children's clothing closet where we issue used clothes for kids. Um, sometimes we provide adult clothing too. We have a farm stand that sets up one Friday a month and we give out free fruits and vegetables. Uh, that, those fruits and vegetables are coming from the food bank and they're, those are coming from a supermarket or a farm that has excess. They're not necessarily fresh and they're not necessarily local. Uh, so that's why we're giving the, it out for free. Uh, typically, we see around 7,000 pounds of produce on those third Fridays, and we give it all out mm -hmm. to around 200 people on average. Um, that's happening this Friday, right? Yep, that's on April 13th, this Friday at the Mid-Hudson Civic Center. Um, in May, we start doing it outside in the big parking lot behind the Chance Theater in Poughkeepsie. And actually, it's a great opportunity to volunteer as a group if you're looking for like bonding activities with friends and like doing something good. Um, if you hop onto our website and click the volunteer link, you can sign up to help us for the next few months. It's really fun. It's a good time. Um, our newer, one of our newer programs is our mobile farmer's market. Um, so with that program, we're driving around a big green trailer, the city of Poughkeepsie, and we're making several stops a week, offering affordable, fresh Hudson Valley grown produce. So that's the distinction between this food 
and the food that's on the farm stand. Um, this food is local, so it either comes from our own small urban farm and garden, or it comes from a farm within 25 miles of where we're located in the city of Poughkeepsie, in the Hudson Valley. And we're selling it. Um, we're selling it, but we're selling it at a, a real discount. So where you would go to like Chappaqua Farmer's Market or Rhinebeck and get a bushel of kale for like four fifty, that same kale is going to be a dollar on our market. We're also accepting SNAP, so EBT benefit, uh, and WIC, so those farmers market nutrition program checks that seniors receive and mothers with infant children receive. Um, that program is really exciting because it's kind of ushered us into this new world in food access of be making the distinction between food and actual real local fresh food that we all know the Hudson Valley is flush with. Um, however, as Leonard mentioned, there's some kind of disconnect happening because typically in low income communities, access to that kind of food is super limited. Um, either it doesn't exist or you have a hard time getting to it because you don't have uh, reliable transportation, the money to get out of the city, or you don't know where, where, where you start to go and get this food. So our mobile market is really kind of creating um, a different kind of food system in the city of Poughkeepsie and introducing these new kinds of foods. And so far, uh, we're in our fourth season, and we have served in those four seasons, I would say, over 50,000 residents of the city of Poughkeepsie. Uh, and we've kind of changed the behavior of health uh, and of food access. And, and, you know, people are now requesting kohlrabi and, like, radishes. And kids are, like, begging their parents for beets. And it's really exciting. Um, what's even more exciting about that program is that we're growing around, each season we're growing around 3,000 pounds of our own food right in the center of the city of Poughkeepsie. And not in boxes, we're growing in the ground. So if you know anything about urban city, urban, you know, what's happened to our cities and our land, um, all of it's brownfield, most of it, I shouldn't say all of it. A lot of it is contaminated and you can't even, you're not supposed to even like touch it, I guess, and like live on it unless it's remediated. Um, I shouldn't say touch it. Don't be, <laughs> don't be afraid to walk around the grass in the city of Poughkeepsie. Um, but brownfield is this distinction, right, between greenfield and brownfield. I guess it's a development and environmental management. Greenfield right. being brand new, you know, um, previously either undeveloped or at least, I don't know if agriculture counts in that. And that's, you know, when we talk about urban sprawl and stuff, that is the precious resources being redeveloped. Right. Meanwhile, suburban sprawl, you know, consumes all that greenfield space. There's all this, you know, often in cities particularly where suburbanization has been about urban flight. Um, you know, there's all this brown field uh, that is now often cheaper in terms of real estate. Uh, and some of it's in foreclosure. Sometimes cities right. own this stuff and can give you a good deal. Right, right. And even a lot of the times, if it is considered a brown field, what I'm learning now in the industrial building agency is that you have to build, you have to dig out a big hole and then cap it and then put more soil, fresh soil and then you can build places where people can live safely. So it's not really desirable. Not, that being said, you can't grow food in that kind of soil. So we're lucky we're growing in the ground. We're in the Family Partnership Center. It's been protected, that space back there, because it's been a school since that building was put up and that land back there has been fenced off. Um, so that you know has taken us into this farming world where we are now able to put more of our own produce in our food pantry and offer that to our pantry clients. We're now, now able to take that food and put it into the lunchbox and prepare that. Um, not just that, but last year we distributed 14,000 pounds out of the mobile market program. Besides the 3,000 pounds that we grew ourselves, the rest of that came from our local farming partners. So Poughkeepsie Farm Project over here is a huge partner of ours. Fishkill Farms, Over Creek Farm, um, Grass and Grit, donates eggs to our market. We get Hudson Valley fresh yogurt that's like just past date, but still like okay to eat. Um, we're getting grains, we're getting honey, we're getting fruit, and we wouldn't exist without our farming partners. And you know, we, we're we working closely, more closely with them, so that we can help to kind of stimulate and stabilize our urban <coughs> food system in the city of Poughkeepsie. And you know, one thing that farmers hate more than farming, I'm just kidding, they love farming, 
more than getting paid not what they're worth, I, I should say, is wasting the food that they've spent so much time and money growing. Unfortunately, when you're a small scale farm, you can't always get to that food. A lot of that food is left in the field, tilled under, um, or just, you know, they, they just can't harvest it. So now what we're seeing is this resurgence of gleaning organizations. Um, and so what that means is people who are volunteers or they're paid now, typically, go out to a farm, go into the fields, and harvest that produce for the farmer. And the farmer allows it to happen, uh, free of charge. And then they take that food and they bring it to places like Duchess Outreach or other places that need it. And this is not something new. Actually, gleaning was first, um, they used to glean back in like the, you know, what, was, what time? The like, medieval period. Yeah, the medieval yeah. period. And actually, it was worked in, like, if you were a farmer or a landowner, a percentage of your produce that you were growing, you had to leave for other people to take. Crazy, right? It's nuts to me. But, like, wouldn't that make the world a better place now if we were able to do that? And so now we're kind of, like, getting back into that. And we, we have all this food that typically would have gone to waste. I think it's something like 40% of the food that's produced here in the United States ends up in the garbage. And meanwhile, you have one in seven households in the United States uh, that are considered food insecure. In, I'm sorry, one in four households in the United States that are considered food insecure. One in seven households in the city of Poughkeepsie are considered food insecure. Um, and so, yeah, food insecurity. Yeah. I'm like kind of jumping around a little bit, but I think, um, is everyone following? Yeah. I talk a lot. And we're still just, and so, and then, we're still talking about just Duchess outreach, right. so um, uh, yeah, you know, you got the garden in the back, which is that is that just for the right? So the garden, half of it, it's fifteen thousand square feet. Uh, half of it we That's farm. Huge. It's big. Yeah, it's like, a big space. What was it bigger than this? Yeah, it's bigger than this room. I would say it's like four of these rooms. Wow. So there's like a corner of the garden, maybe even a little bit bigger. Can I just pause here? Yeah. Do you all know where the Family Partnership Center is? Or have you, has anyone, for instance, done field work at the Family Partnership Center? You look familiar. I think I helped out with the Feeding the Hudson Valley event, and I okay. think you were there, like, yes. chopping vegetables yes. as well. Yes, cool, <laughs> fun, good time. So, okay, so this is in the city of Poughkeepsie. It's in downtown on Hamilton Street, and um, it was one of, before it was the Family Partnership Center, it was uh, one of the two public high schools in the city of Poughkeepsie. And um, for a variety of reasons, you know, starting with population decline, starting with the formation of the SPAC and Kill school district in the southern side of the city, suddenly, you know, um, the city of Poughkeepsie couldn't afford to keep open <coughs> two high schools. And so this one was closed, and it's an old-fashioned high school. I mean, it looks, you know, you walk in and it feels like American 20th century high school. There's the cafeteria down there, there's an auditorium. Um, and so this has become uh, this sort of one-stop social agency center, the Family Partnership Center, where a number of local agencies are based. If you do field work with the Office of Community Engaged Learning, like they may set you up with one of these. and a number of Vassar students, as well as a lot of other people, are you know, taking the bus down to the Family Partnership Center. So, and then you guys have like, you got big real estate in the Family Partnership Center because you got the yeah. lunchbox. I mean, right. you're you're actually not you're just an presence. office, right? right? Yeah. So we have a we have our offices on the second floor, and then in the garden wing we have the lunchbox, which is a, a big kitchen and a cafeteria style. Uh, and then we have that space, all that farmland, which is, is recent for us. We just took over ownership of that entire space. Um, and so back to what you were saying, half of it we farm ourselves. And we have a greenhouse, a small hoop house on. And then the other half we issue to community members so they can grow their own food. Um, so that's granting land sovereignty for people who live in the city of Poughkeepsie who don't necessarily have enough space to farm themselves or who can't build boxes and you want a plot of like their own land. Um, Can I ask, what is land sovereignty? So just getting back to, you know, when, it, well, how it used to be, I'll say, in the, in the country, in the, in the land of the world, um, is that we had land to grow our food on or to raise our livestock 
um, and to do the things that we needed to do in order to survive. Since we've moved away from that kind of lifestyle into these urban centers, that land has been taken away from us. So a lot of us are now living in apartment units. Um, we're living in really dense area or highly populated areas with not a lot of space. Um, and so we're granting back that space to individuals who, for years, for their in their entire their lineage, they used to have all that farmland um, to come back and farm again and to kind of take back root in, in their history and their culture, which is a lot of the case with the people who farm in the community garden. Um, we have this gentleman who's from Jamaica whose family grew up farming, and he farms all of those kinds of crops. And he has like, like such cool character to the space, and we have this woman who lives in an apartment with her daughter who doesn't have space but wants more than like a box, you know, like a tiny window box. And she has a huge plot now. Um, and now, this is the exciting part, we have a healthcare organization who have uh, rented a plot for their employees. So Hudson River Healthcare is going to have a plot out in the garden, which is really exciting because one of the things we started doing through our farm market and our farm is issuing, we're working with healthcare uh, organizations to issue prescriptions for our fresh market and with that vouchers for their patients who are considered food insecure. Um, the way that a practitioner would indicate that is there's a screening with two questions that you kind of work into the flow when you ask all those usual questions like how's your back, you know, you're eating enough iron and then you'd ask these two questions and then if it's a positive screen for food insecurity they would then you know issue them a fake prescription we're not like you know the doctors were a little bit hesitant on that part, but a fake prescription with vouchers that they can use at our market, which is really exciting. Um, and we started piloting that program last year, and this year we're going to start to kick that into gear. But having a healthcare organization farming just shows that, you know, this nutritional density and value, how, how it exists in these farmed foods, as opposed to the foods that you're getting in the grocery store that aren't necessarily local. Uh, are locally farmed and really uh, you know what your community food assessment and the paper that you wrote was indicating was you know for low-income communities it's unfair that they just don't have that choice to make they can't make that choice to say or typically they weren't able to make the choice between Hudson Valley farm produce or produce that you get from tropical fresh that's probably from Mexico and it's still good like eat it However, the more a, a, a fresh food travels, the le like that depletes its nutrient value the further it goes. And plus, how can we consider that you know we're stimulating our local food system if we're not purchasing locally or using the food that's you know harvest or produced locally? But anyways. Okay. Yeah, Ethan. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what would kind of make a you know individual family or an area food insecure. Just thinking of like the combination of, does it have to do more with like the individual or an area's socioeconomic status or does it have to do more with kind of access, what type of agriculture right. so or food is around or can you even distinguish those? I'm really glad you asked that question because I've been saying food security, food insecurity, um, and this term is different than being hungry. Um, what this term was developed to indicate was you don't necessarily have access to healthy nutritional foods. So you, that meaning you could go to the bodega and you can load up on your chips, your bread, your Twinkies, and you're getting all the calories you need. However, you're not getting the nutrients and the vitamins and the minerals you need. And so you could be demonstrating symptoms of nutritional deficiencies. Um, and you know, if anyone knows anything about eating a lot of sugar, you're gonna experience those highs and lows and, and the crash and the longevity of that kind of eating isn't, um, it, it, it's not, you know, it's not for the long haul. Um, and that has to do with your, yeah, socioeconomic, the area that you live because you have limited access to transportation that can take you away from those bodegas or those supermarkets that only serve those kinds of foods. Um, and that's because of, you know, low income. And, you know, so that, what, some, something that we're, we've been examining at Dutchess Outreach is the need for our programs exists because of this baked in poverty that we're experiencing now in across America. So, you know, something that recently has been released is a new um, world income inequality report. 
And what it shows is the income disparity in the United States, but it shows it as compared to the rest of the countries in the world. And But in the United States, what it shows, which I thought was super alarming, which relates to these urban cities that, you know, mostly have these problems with food insecurity and access to healthier foods, is that something like, and don't quote me on this, but the, the bottom 50% are earning less money than the top 50% are holding in this country. So I'm going to say it one more time, and I'm going to reverse it too. The top 50% of um, those who have income are holding that income, holding more of that income than the bottom 50% are earning. So that then creates this gap of wealth. And this is a, a system flaw um, that we're experiencing in this country. And if anyone, is anyone familiar with Noam Chomsky? He's like my fave. <laughs> But he's been saying this for years, and now finally this report is laying it out nicely, you know, with scientists behind the text and these nice beautiful graphs, just proving exactly what he's been spewing. People are like, shh, no, come on, sit down, go back to MIT. But yeah, it's really alarming, and it exists like, you know, I, I see a skewed uh, vision of this, because at Dutchess Outreach, those who we serve are literally almost at the lowest point of their life. And they're having a really, really, really hard time. However, a lot of Americans right now and also other residents of the city of Gipsy are literally like one paycheck away from being in that, being in that position. Um, and so that is one of the alarming things, but that contributes to food insecurity. Uh, and so that then contributes to your um, occupational opportunity that contributes to how you are being educated, whether or not you have, you know, as a kid, that mental capacity to learn um, your health indi indicators. They now more, I think it's like 80% of the negative factors influencing our health, negatively influencing our health, are due to uh, behavioral factors such as poor nutrition. So there's a lot of things happening in these, in these communities that have, typically have lower incomes and are experiencing extreme poverty. I can just sort of add to that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess just a kind of follow-up question there would be, I mean, you said that there's about one in seven households in Poughkeepsie, but one in four in the United States. But is Poughkeepsie one in four? Yeah, let me check. I have my else. No, it's definitely one in seven. No, it's it is one in four in, in Poughkeepsie. It's one in four in Poughkeepsie, in Poughkeepsie and yes, then maybe it's one, one in seven. And one in seven. Yeah. Yes. Okay, yes. I was going to ask how Poughkeepsie was doing yeah. better than the rest of the country. Yeah, no, you're but right. Good question. That answers I, that question. I should question. know because yeah. the last report we did, that was where we came. Yeah. We, that was the whole purpose of this survey was right. first to get an estimate of food insecurity in the city of Poughkeepsie. Mm. Yeah. One of the things that you asked, um, you know, what does the areas that people live in have to do with their food insecurity. This is actually a, a complex question and it's a hot field of just, you know, academic and study and professional, you know, like the health professions planning their intervention in. And some of the change, thinking is still changing. Um, so think about this first. Food insecurity, we think of it it's something that individuals experience or, you know, generally the unit of analysis we talk about is the household. If you live by yourself, you just live in a household of one. Or you may have roommates, you're a household of however many, you're a family. Those are, you know, because households shop for each other, households pool their income. Um, and certainly poverty, you know, uh, insofar as like we live in a cash economy, that too is a, is a household kind of characteristics. So there are these sort of individual level characteristics and the question is then what is the relationship of larger units, you know, cities for instance. Uh, cities are places, and this isn't actually true of all cities now because we could talk about like Manhattan, you know, and it's not, it's not concentrated poverty, you know, the way that it might have even done 50 years ago anymore. Some cities are doing very well, and you see poverty on the outskirts of cities. But definitely when we talk about sort of like the urban crisis, cities are places where um, because of suburbanization, which was available to the middle class, people who are left behind are disproportionately poor. 
they're disproportionately people of color. They're um, disproportionately uh, people with uh, difficult employment circumstances because many of the new jobs have left cities as well. Um, and so in that sense, like cities are just places where poor people are and there's always this question like, you know, what's, is it better to be a wealthy person in a poor city? Is it better to be a poor person in a wealthy suburb? You know, those are, those are important kind of, you know, theoretical questions to think through. The, but cities and places are also, they have certain features, or to be theoretical, there's the mechanism by which it carries the effect of, like, cities are tough for poor people. One of the classics is economic development and grocery stores. So a term we were using a lot in the last 10 years was food deserts. Food desert is described in an urban area as an uh, area without a with a certain level of um, poverty concentration, it has to be like a third, the residents have to be about a third poor minimum. And there is no grocery store within 500 feet. Um, and the premise here first is that in this urban area, people could walk to a grocery store. Um, out in, outside of cities, that, that radius becomes two miles, because the premise there is people are it's an auto-centered neighborhood. For a long time, people were focused on food deserts because they thought that is what cities do to exacerbate food insecurity. And so the city of Poughkeepsie is a good example. As you might have read, until 2011, the city of Poughkeepsie went for a good 20 years without a formal grocery store in city limits. Um, if you take Main Street down, the first change to that was this medium grocery store, Casa Latina. And then in 2011, what's now Market Fresh appeared. Right. And Market Fresh, that's still like closer to Vassar. So still downtown, you could measure there were two census tracts where they were still food deserts. Still now, even today. Well, I'm guessing Tropical Fresh the appearance right. of that in that neighborhood. Now there is a downtown grocery store. Right. So it's still at the end of the first and the second. Okay. Order. But yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the food desert in area in Poughkeepsie has gone down. And so one question that's obvious now is has that made a difference? And that's one of the things that we're doing by repeating this survey. We're just gonna get a basic before and after. And it's not a pure kind of causal analysis, but there's a good inference. Like if it gets much better, you know, one reason might be, well, now there's a grocery store. Yeah, no, it's, that's what makes it so significant yeah. and exciting. Actually now, there's a lot of debate about whether food deserts really matter. Okay, uh, and because if you still don't have the money, how useful is it to have a grocery store if you can't avail yourself of what's there. So this question that you asked, I, it's just a long way of saying, it's actually really important to think this out. Like is, you know, food insecurity and the causes of food insecurity a specifically household level phenomenon? It's about people are unemployed or underemployed, uh, don't make enough to feed their families, and cities are just places that concentrate people in those situations? Mm -hmm. Or are there certain things about cities that exacerbate it? One thing that should help it, we sort of assumed, was mass transit. That's another thing that cities have because of their density. And that's a whole big question too, yeah. right? So does the, the, now the county bus system really help people get to grocery stores? Yeah, Nick. Um, I'm wondering if, um, or either of you, um, think that this is a, uh, a problem that the solution to should come from government, whether it be like local, state, or federal level, um, and if so, how does, um, how does doing this type of work as a nonprofit potentially, or do you think it potentially has the effect of, um, like taking the ownership of like providing 
save healthy food for low income people like off the government and placing it on to like not for profits or private companies? Well, you know, that's an interesting question because, you know, in the latest budget, um, one of the things that they wanted to do was cut SNAP benefits um, for individuals. And instead of giving a lot of people that money for SNAP, they wanted the government, the federal government, wanted to issue prepackaged boxes of food to people that were called harvest boxes. However, contained no harvested food. Um, we, so, you know, the federal government at this point, I guess, seems to think that the better way to do, you know, to kind of tackle food insecurity is for them to take over and issue these packaged boxes. Um, the hope that we have as a nonprofit is that we can rally support from our local farming partners, from our anchoring organizations that exist in Indiana, like the universities and the hospitals. Um, and the other larger businesses, uh, and our nonprofit partners and our educators around this idea of a new food economy um, that considers food that needs to get to the hands of people who aren't necessarily making enough income, and you know, vice versa. So it's kind of like a mixed food economy uh, that promotes local, sustainable food systems. And you know, that's a large order for a small nonprofit, but we're kind of moving in that direction thanks to private funding, um, private foundations who have taken the cause on as you know something that they really care about and they want to see stimulated in the Hudson Valley specifically because of you know what we're known for and that is food. Um, uh, you know, and and through those collaborations and partnerships, we're hoping then to try and solve the issue. But the issue is, like Leonard was saying, so you know deep-seated and there's so many factors involved that affect it from development to school systems to education and health and yeah. Well you know a question just to turn towards the other hat you wear which is a common council member. Um, like what can the city of Poughkeepsie do? So an example, um, the city of Poughkeepsie struggles to keep a, a regular non-mobile farmers market, right? right? Why? Right, um, and you know now there's an, a farmers market that's stable and stationary. Started last summer down at the the waterfront, the children's okay. but the children's museum is managing that. Um, right. and Do you guys know where that is? The children's yeah. museum, like um, it's it's just north of the train station. And if you were a, like the train station has a giant parking lot, and then there's one last road, and you walk like a block down. And you're walking past the river. There's the Children's Museum, which is a nice little children's museum. It's a destination. And they have this plaza, this Huge covered room. plaza. Yeah. That, so that's where So that during is. the summer on Monday nights, Mondays from 3 to 7, mm -hmm. there's a, a farmer market. And we're there with our mobile market. However, they last season was the first, and they didn't make as much money. So they're kind of cutting their season really short. But I mean, the city has tried to have successful farmers markets, but they aren't administering them, them themselves. They have to count on local organizations. So Poughkeepsie Farm, Farm Project tried for a while, and it just didn't do well. And I know the Poughkeepsie Alliance, which is a nonprofit group of business leaders, are trying to start another farmers market in the city of Poughkeepsie. But I think, you know, it's with farmers markets, and I, I only know this because a lot of my friends manage markets. and. That first season, even your first three seasons, it's not going to be what you think, and vendors are going to have to kind of like stick with you. Um, and then, you know, you see the people come because they have to figure out where it is, figure out why they want to go there, and then you have that consistent vendor that's always going to be there. So the Beacon Farmers Market didn't happen overnight in the Cold Spring and Chapqua. Those all took time to build, and the city just, they haven't been able to get that administrator to stick with it. Mm -hmm. um, and that could be one of the issues. You know, you really have to just like keep at it and trust that every season it will get bigger and bigger. Um, I think another, you know, what we can do on a policy level and in supporting the initiative is we have this thing called the Downtown Revitalization Initiative. And it's a grant program that cities go for a year up year. And we can write food and food security into that proposal and try and look for funding 
to promote these kinds of ideas and move forward like projects like what you're doing and projects that we're doing kind of up through the city. My dream, a grocery store. That's kind of like the model of the daily table. Have you heard of that? Mm -hmm. So the former CEO of Trader Joe's made this grocery store with produce that is recently gleaned or recently past date that they process and prep and put into you know containers for sale at a discount. Um, they accept all public benefit assistance dollars. My dream, and I'm saying this publicly right now because I'm telling you to take it. <laughs> My dream is to have like um, a side by side like fresh, marketable produce from local farms, and then just past state from this fresh, marketable produce that's been processed and prepped, and either put to stock to sell at a discount, or if it can't be sold at a discount, donated to food access organizations like Duchess Outreach. And so you're making it's a co-op model. Um, Ideally, it would be like owner, owner owned, like worker owned, um, and that kind of thing. So it wouldn't really take much to stabilize the revenue. Um, but yeah, that's the dream. I have a few spots picked out. So if anyone wants to work on that with me, yeah. I'm wondering if you can kind of talk about the public health costs of food insecurity as it, instead of food hunger? I mean, is that coming from people like checking into the ER with hyponatremia or is it like... So, that, I know? can't answer all that like so well because that's just not my field, but I will say a really interesting um, statistic that I read in the World Income Inequality Report was that those bottom 50 that are earning less than the top 10 are holding, most of what they spend, most of where their income goes, is on in healthcare. Uh, so they're paying for their healthcare costs with all the money that they're, they're earning, which is telling. And then I can also tell you that instances of diet-related illnesses increase in low-income communities like the city of Poughkeepsie. Um, and so in the Fresh Market Prescription Program that I described, one of the things that was really exciting and weird was that these doctors sent me lists of their patient diagnosis which I was like, cool, what can I do with all this data? Um, obviously it's anonymous, but it's interesting because I'm seeing the rate and for the, you know, the children's medical group of how many patients they see that have, are obese or have diabetes or diagnosed with this. And then the idea was to track which patients then they issued these dollars to, which patients were actually coming and using the dollars on the mobile market, and then are we seeing health, you know, um, Incre like their health healthiness increase and we're actually now trying to make a new metric because a lot of the grant funders want to see with these kinds of initiatives what kind of health outcomes you're affecting on your communities so we're trying to measure nutrient um, value sold through our mobile market so we have all our sales data and then we've crunched our average weight of item of produce, and we found you know the grams versus calories versus nutrient density versus vitamin minerals, and then we have a number that we're going to crunch and to say the daily average value, nutritional value sold, and we can be like, bam, mm -hmm. give me money. You know, another area where um, it's clear sort of the public health impact of food insecurity is found is schools. Right, so. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong, um, but this, for instance, the city of Poughkeepsie School District, you know, uh, eligibility for free or reduced lunches is an income thing. It's one of the most stable indicators you have of like, you know, people's household economics and and what that means for you know the potential for food insecurity. And so in the city of Poughkeepsie, everyone is either eligible for free or reduced. Yep. You know, and 100%. that's generally not the case, particularly out in affluent neighborhoods. Then it's much; it's a fraction of the school body here. It's a hundred percent. So lunches are real. Oh my goodness! It's spam. This is my daily phone spam that I get. <laughs> um, so out here, um, first school lunches are a big thing. Um, second, we hear about a lot of school teachers across America, like in the morning, their students show up, and it's clear they haven't eaten. Right? Dinner so, or breakfast. Yeah, so, you know, now um, all the work that teachers are doing, buying their own supplies and stuff, increasingly a lot of teachers are like, I'm buying food for my students. Right. And then the big crisis is summer. Yeah. 
Yep. Because suddenly the one meal that, you know, food insecure households could count on for their kids is gone mm -hmm. with the vacation. So can you say something about like the school situation yeah. here and food insecurity? Yeah, so it's a it's a real big problem in the schools and a lot of teachers have drawers stocked of snacks like peanut butter and jelly for their kids out of their own pockets because, you know, I don't think there's anything more discouraging than trying to teach kids who are nodding off because they're hungry. Um, and who can't focus because they're hungry or they're hopped up on sugar. Um, it's a real crisis and, you know, we provide after school meals for that reason. Um, and then we do also ourselves provide the school, the summer meals during uh, summer lunch hour. And then other organizations in the community are doing that as well. Um, but right now the city of Poughkeepsie school district is one of the poorest districts in Dutchess County, uh, if not, the poorest, but it's going through some um, leadership changes right now. But yeah, one of the things that we're, we're trying to work with the school in starting up more food pantries. So the Moore School, which is an elementary school, now has a food pantry at the school, which is great. Um, and then we also started um, the backpack program, which packs bags for kids over the weekend of food. So they'll go home and they'll know that they have that meal for the weekend or their families can have that meal for the weekend which is very encouraging um one of the other you know huge impacts besides physical health is our mental health you know if you're hungry you could have display symptoms of depression anxiety of adhd of all these other things that aren't you know it's fine if they're if that's what you're diagnosed it's fine but a lot of it could have to do with the fact that you're not getting a balanced meal or enough to eat um, not just that, there's like huge social implications to not being able to feed your family. So if you're a parent of kids and you know you didn't give them breakfast, you're not sure if they're eating your lunch, and you're not sure if you're going to be able to give them dinner, how are you going to perform throughout your day, you know, having that kind of anxiety? Uh, that takes a toll, and that is kind of contributing to these higher levels of stress that we're experiencing in, in this situation. Um, but yeah. The, the hunger and the food insecurity in schools is something that, for me, you know, in an ideal situation, schools should be a safe haven for kids that kind of go home to a chaotic life. Um, and in schools, we should be able to ensure that our kids are going to get breakfast, they're going to get lunch, and maybe they're going to get a snack before they go home as something that exists as part of that day. You know, especially in public schools, when you're educating youth, these are like the most formative years of our life. And if you don't get that, if you aren't getting that food, you're not going to develop mentally, physically. Um, there's so many negative implications. But um, that's something that we, I just don't even know where to start to navigate. And that's something that could come from the federal government. But like locally, you know, we need school uh, and education reform, especially in New York State. We have an opportunity to do that. And I think the assembly is trying to do something like that. But yeah. So maybe we can talk about, I mean, here's the city, and it's a, you know, it's a place where food insecurity is, you know, um, a, a particular problem. There is food insecurity out in the country, you know, by the way, it should be clear, like, you know, it's not all, it's a socioeconomically very uneven, you know, outside of cities uh, as well. but. Um, there's a problem of eating, there's a problem of like developing markets, whether it's grocery stores, uh, whether it's farmers markets, you know, and sort of getting that end of it. And then there's like agriculture around. And, you know, of course, farming has its own issues, it has its own problems, right? We've talked about the decline of, you know, big farms, family farms, uh, how expensive the land is mm -hmm. out here particularly. Um, but I mean, I guess maybe even before we turn to our resident expert here, <laughs> um, what do you think are like the potential connections or relations or, you know, like missed opportunities between like what's, what's happening where there's food insecurity and then what's happening about, you know, agriculture in the Hudson Valley? One thing. I don't want to miss on rich people at all. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Mother Mary is very cool. Um, but my uh, initial 
um, reception of the project was different from the uh, actual implementation of it. They seem to focus on upscale brands of like snack foods and stuff like that mm -hmm. um, in order to move product, um, because that's how you do it with good marketing. Um, whereas I had expected from the, I think the name Farm Bridge led me to believe that it was connecting um, uh, locals and perhaps the city of Poughkeepsie with um, uh, fresh food from local farms. Um, but it would, and they also mentioned um, partnering with services like Blue Apron, which are also upscale delivery services. Um, so obviously they need to turn a profit to continue existing. Um, uh, but that it seems to be, I don't know, um, I guess something that I expected to be included in their mission statement, but didn't seem to be um, feeding people in um, the city. Yeah. 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 What else? What was the question I can hear? Well, just like what are, when we think about what seem to be two different worlds, right? The problems of food insecurity in cities and then the, the problems but the potentials uh, for agriculture in the Hudson Valley around these cities. Like, what are some of the connections or opportunities maybe we're missing? You know, just sort of thinking out loud about this, right? Because these are conceivably, at least by region, they share the same food system. Mm -hmm. Conceivably. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, yeah. Sorry, I talked a lot. Um, but I don't know, I see that as, there, there seems to be a lot of middle, middlemen, for lack of, like, like, farms are having trouble getting product to consumers or to someone who's going to buy it at a rate that, you know, allows them to turn a profit and sustain what they're doing. Consumers are having a problem getting access to fresh produce, fresh, you know, meat, healthy, organic, local, you know, whatever ag buzzword you want to throw on top of it that makes it better for you. <laughs> but those are kind of the solution, like each of those is the solution to the other's problems if consumers have access directly to the farms, if Farm Bridge actually bridged that gap. I mean, I see, has there been any evidence showing that like the more you can have, like the more you can take out the middlemen, the, the more direct to consumer the food is, the healthier, the cheaper, the more beneficial to the consumer and the farmer that is? Or is this industry in place for a reason besides to sustain itself on capital? I mean, if, I would say historically taking out the middlemen is always a benefit, if we can. I mean, we can look at blockchain and cryptocurrencies <laughs> for that, right? But yeah, I, I, you know, Farm Bridge, what they're doing is very unique uh, and it is of value, but I do see what you've just presented and I, I've seen that for a while. Um, and, and what you're saying, there's the organization called the Farm Hub, yeah. which one of my colleagues works at uh, up in Hurley, near Kingston. And what they do is more uh, tailored to providing food to people who need it. Yes, and which we really have a great Yeah, yeah, and uh, our host last week, Jim Hyland, he did mention there's the farm hub, and right. he said that's more about, you know, the, like farmers, it's, it's just distribution for their more sort of direct produce, right? right. This is clearly like, and we jar it, and Street. you can cook it, you know. Right. Um, but so. I mean, yeah, there's still that gap that exists, yeah. which you're presenting, and which other people in this industry, specifically here in the Hudson Valley, are also kind of considering now, and, and that's these small scale farms, how can they make revenue consistently, you know? besides going through some other organization that's going to put their food out, and pump their food out to, you know, like the farm bridge. Um, and that is a real, you know, that, that's an issue that exists and, and people are thinking about it, but there's no solution yet. I mean, whether it's just as easy as cutting out the middleman, but then how will you get your food out at all when you're a small staff uh, and you don't necessarily have those resources. So there's a solution that lies somewhere in between, you know, for-profit, non-profit, farming industries and the donation and for like purchasing channels mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that's something that people are trying to move efforts into examining yeah one thing you know when we think about this talk about food system distribution which is just sort of like how do you get from farms to mouths right um, the most obvious step of this is like the store 
okay, the retail store, but also a farmer's market, right? You know, that is, it's not just direct to consumer. When you bring all those farms together and you give them a choice, you're literally creating a, a store-like environment where they have choices, they can, mm -hmm. you know, they, they gain efficiencies in shopping that just going to individual farms they can, right? Um, the farm bridge, right? The effort of like, not just jawing and stuff like that, but adding new value, right? Value added. So you may want food not during the growing season, the most obvious one, right? Uh, so the ability to do that. Or like, what do I do with tomatoes, marinara, you know? And yes, it does get, it does start to spread into, you know, where do I get my fancy custom hot sauce, you know, that's jarred there. Uh, some of this is not, it's not very, like, clear it's agricultural origins, but, you know, mm. they too are trying to kind of create a robust model. One of the things I see in this area where they know it's missing, they're working very hard, and there's a lot of energy, whether it's the farm hub, farm bridge, a variety of things, is in that middle area. The infrastructure to distribute, not just like from farm, you know, across geography, but also to create new products and stuff. The other thing too is, with some, with maybe some exceptions, I don't know. For instance, the farm hubs model. Mm -hmm. Right now, all of that's taking a for-profit kind of face, right? And that is a an important question, like. Let me, you know, we might say, oh, that's tough because, you know, it's too bad because people are, you know, being, are not being able to access food through, the, you know, the pure market capitalist economy. On the other hand, to talk about the sustainability as an enterprise, you know, its political viability, I mean, one can reasonably ask, is it fair to expect this all to take place under a non-profit? economy, you know, do you necessarily need to make this a business kind of enterprise and not, say, a charitable activity? Do people, you know, there's, there are economists who study these things in terms of how people value uh, goods that they get, and sometimes when it's given to them free, they don't value them the same way when they have the opportunity to buy it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it seems like the, the mobile market is very much operating on that premise. Right. Not just are you trying to help out the, the farmers, but right. yeah. there is demand to buy right. and not just receive, you know, yeah, and fresh food. Yeah, it restores that choice to people. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there's some kind of dignity involved with being able to purchase your own food as opposed to getting it for free, even for people who are low income. So we consider it an equitable model of food provider. Um, but yeah, what you're saying about, you know, does it necessarily have to be a, a non-for-profit charity doing this kind of work or, you know, a business doing this kind of work, I think there could be something in between that exists um, to benefit both sides and all sides, I guess, of it. But um, yeah, the Farm Hub does do a lot of donation also. Um, but they're also working on distribution channels and you know their supply chain management, which is a huge problem for people if you don't have that down. I think that one of the flaws in most systems is in delivery of goods and services. I think that was like Michael Porter wrote that about like the healthcare system or something. That big fat book. What is it called? Redesigning or redefining health. I don't know. It's a great book, read it. But it's really long. But anyways. Yeah, there's, there's these things. I think that we're really looking for innovative solutions, innovative, locally-minded solutions to these problems um, so we can survive the future apocalypse. JK, strike that. <laughs> um, I have a question. Um, so, so far, and um, it seems like the most, I don't know, to my mind, the best solution to cutting out the middleman and providing um, food to people in low-income communities would be to um, partner uh, farmers with uh, like corner stores and bodegas um, owned by the community. Um, mm -hmm. Is any of that happening? Mm -hmm. No, so not as not as extensively. Um, I know, you know, as far as I know, the bodegas 
they don't carry much of, in the way of fresh produce. They have like fruits, but that's a great idea. I think that that's awesome. Uh, you know, Adams, one of our local grocers, they partner with local farmers and carry their items. Um, but I think the for sale and the market value of the items may be a little bit too high priced, or maybe farmers aren't going there. But I mean, that's something to investigate. And I think that that would be cool if we could have, you know, a deli or bodega in the city of Poughkeepsie that had like food source from the Poughkeepsie Farm Project, you know? Um, yeah. One of the key things here is, you know, can you sustain the market? And by that, we simply mean, do you get enough customers, enough demand to like make this work? And, you know, keep the supply of fresh food, right? Bodega is the, you know, we see this, we asked about this in our survey and our focus groups. They're infamous for, there's not enough demand for fresh food, so when you happen to be that rare shopper that wants it, you're looking at, you know, produce that's poor quality, it's right. always bad, they, people complain about it. And it's kind of a vicious circle, right? There's not the demand, so they can't keep stocking it. To use like a very different example, in New York City, um, they have carts, you know, with uh, produce, and they get so much foot traffic, you know, this is not necessarily people who, it's not a destination, you know, the way like, I gotta go to the grocery store and, you know, shop here, it's just along the way, suddenly, I realized I needed some lettuce or tomatoes or things, and there's so much foot traffic that they can sustain the demand, mm -hmm. they can, you know, stock a cart and by, you know, the end of the day it's gone and that means great, there's enough to keep it coming back the next day. One of the things that, you know, this is an interesting issue of Poughkeepsie and I think a lot of, um, you know, um, struggling cities, they're often too small. Right? They actually don't have the population. They're not growing, or at least not very quickly, to sustain this kind of demand. Mm -hmm. right? uh, so in the absence of just that kind of numbers, you know, businesses have to do things like sell more, and you get prestige products, premium products. And there is more of a market, a sufficient market, for those kind of higher value-added goods here. But just the demand for fresh produce. It's not that people don't realize they need it or want it, it's just that there's not enough of them to sustain that distribution. And another really important thing to consider, specifically in schools, is the, um, you know, Vassar recently just had a renovation of the cafeteria, and formerly it was heat and serve. And in a lot of schools in the area, it's the same way. So you can't even prepare fresh produce. So we have a really motivated, um, you know, uh, food and nutrition educator, director, whatever, of the school district down in Beacon who wants to be able to take fruit from a local farm called Common Ground and all they can take is greens to make salad because they don't have the facilities to prepare the fresh food. And that's in the city of Poughkeepsie as well. So, you know, Chef Dave is the head chef at in the city of Poughkeepsie districts and he would love to take fresh, more fresh food, but they just can't prepare it. Um, and so that's an infrastructure challenge that we face. And that is a money thing, too. Um, you know, and the other thing is, you know, a lot of, I used to farm. I farmed for one single summer, which was great. It sounds like a past tense. It's going to be, well, you know, I say it like that because I'm planning a book, and it'll be my summer farming, the full chapter. Uh -huh. um, but anyways, it was great. Uh, and it kind of changed my perspective of farming and food. And also introduced me to a lot of farmers who are now my friends. And they're all small scale, mostly vegetable and livestock farms and farmers who don't own their own land because they can't afford it and they're leasing land. And recently what's been happening is they're losing that land and they're losing those leases uh, because the land's being developed or it's being given away at a higher price and they're not able to do what they love to do. Not only that, but they're not getting paid a lot of money to do this and they're typically not getting any benefit. And so they're getting sick and they're not able to pay their health bills and they're barely able to afford their rent. And they're doing hard labor, they're feeding us, you know, they're feeding their communities. And they feel super fulfilled in that and knowing they're doing that. However, how can that be sustainable, right? And I know already this season, like three farmers who were told at the end of March that they're not gonna have their land for the season. 
And so that puts them out of work for an entire season. And so a lot of farmers are leaving. They're going to grad school, which is fine. Or they're doing other things. <laughs> but they're not farming. And that's unfortunate because these people are passionate about food. And they're part of the solution. So there needs to be like reform done on another federal or state level in the farm bill about being able to access to land for small farmers, young farmers, ethnic, diverse farmers. Um, you know, there's this new word or term being um, that I heard recently that I couldn't even speak to and define as well as you probably would ask me to, but you should all look it up. It's called food apartheid. Um, write it all down. I don't see anyone writing it down. <laughs> it's really interesting term, and a woman from Soul Fire Farm recently talked on a podcast called I Solidarity about it um, and about how they're making a map of reparations for black farmers uh, who have lost their land or who haven't had access to land or USDA benefits uh, in the past. And, you know, literally we took land away from African American farmers in this country. Um, during like all the homestead and acts and then we enslaved them and then they helped to build the United States agricultural industry and then you know once they were freed, freed uh, they were still not able to earn their livelihood in an industry that has been a part of their history and so that's something that now farmers through this initiative are trying to look into farmers of color and communities of color. But yeah, there's a lot of that. And then don't even get me started about indigenous cultures, <laughs> which is a whole nother story. But there's, it, there's, yeah, a whole nother life. But there's things happening with that too, where we're getting, we're resurrecting seeds from indigenous cultures that used to grow here in the Hudson Valley and cultivating their crops again, which is so exciting. Um, but yeah, there, you know, this land access and land use issue is really huge. And it's something that I like want to see pushed to the forefront of the agricultural industry, especially here in New York State and Dutchess County.